Now let's get going, folks, and we'll begin as we will every day here on Menzoid Mornings with something that's really grinding my gears. Time now for the Menzoid Monologue. Provincial liquor monopolies have been in the news lately, especially in Ontario, where PC leader Tim Hudak says uh, that if elected, he will allow beer and wine in corner stores. And apparently to take some of the steam out of Hudak's pledge, last month, the provincial Liberal government announced a, a trial project in which 10 so-called express LCBO outlets would be established in supermarkets in the months ahead. Uh, the very definition, folks, of too little, too late. Simply put, there's absolutely no valid reason to have government in the liquor distribution and retailing business in the first place. Government's role is to regulate and tax beverage alcohol, but to run a monopoly and an abuse of monopoly at that, sorry, this is wrong on so many levels. Now, the ostensible policy reason for government being in the liquor business is that murky philosophical phrase, booze bureaucrats like to trot out to justify their very existence. Social responsibility. Translation, the evil private sector is obsessed with making money, you see, and since liquor is a potentially dangerous substance if abused, well, only the angelic-like government can possibly be entrusted to sell such products. Insert drum riff here, folks. It's a false argument, of course, given that in Ontario, the LCBO actually has the worst record when it comes to challenging underage customers for ID compared to the beer store chain and ma and pa convenience stores. Heck, we even proved last summer that a 14-year-old kid could walk into numerous LCBO stores and waltz out with bottles of hard liquor, no questions asked. But aside from the competency of LCBO employees, there's another issue at play here, namely the way in which the booze bureaucrats at head office use and even abuse their position in order to line their own pockets. An LCBO insider notes that a number of LCBO employees have received gifts from booze suppliers over the years. And among the other controversies, number one, no one at the board is keeping track of the gifting, thus it's unknown how widespread the practice is. Number two, some LCBO employees apparently haven't declared gifts from suppliers as taxable benefits, which they are. And three, LCBO employees receiving gifts from suppliers may in fact be breaking the law. LCBO spokeswoman Heather McGregor confirms that employees can indeed receive gifts of up to $50. It used to be $200. But if such is the case, i.e. if LCBO employees are receiving gifts from suppliers and then neglecting to declare these gifts as taxable benefits, that would appear to be contrary to federal law. After all, Section 121 of the Criminal Code, quote, prohibits Crown employees from demanding, accepting, or offering or agreeing to accept, directly or indirectly, a commission, reward, or benefit of any kind from a person who has dealings with the government or a government agency, end quote. No dollar limit is mentioned. It gets worse, folks. Aware that the media was onto the gift-giving schemes a while ago, LCBO President and CEO Bob Peter sent a memo to his staff noting that in order to, quote, minimize conflict of in interest situations, the LCBO would be asking its trade partners not to offer gifts or invite LCBO employees to attend sports events, concerts, or other similar events. Translation, the LCBO, on paper at least, was asking its staff to comply with a federal law that has been on the books for decades. But it's perversely amusing to see Mr. Peter suddenly taking the moral high ground when it comes to putting the kibosh on gifts and gratuities from suppliers after all, shortly after being appointed LCBO head honcho, Peter's daughter was given a free year of university tuition, courtesy of Spirits Canada. That's the National Trade Association that represents Canada's major distillers. The value of that tuition? $3,000. Now, does anyone else not see the, brutal, the brutal conflict of interest at play here? The only retail distribution channel for whiskey, gin, rum, and all other hard liquor is indeed the LCBO and a trade association that depends on LCBO shelf space for its membership pays for the post-secondary education of the daughter of the, LC of the LCBO CEO. Wow! P 
Peter did not respond to repeated requests for an interview, but then again, how does one justify something that appears to be so downright unjustifiable? But folks, here's the real reason for this rant. If there is indeed malfeasance of any sort going on at the LCBO, who exactly is the sheriff in town when it comes to laying down the law and enacting justice? And the answer is, such a sheriff does not exist. Allow me to explain. In 1998, the Ontario government created a new regulator called the Alcohol and Gaming Commission of Ontario. As its very name implies, the AGCO regulates the alcohol trade. But guess what? Inexplicably exempted from the regulations of the AGCO is, you guessed it, the LCBO, the largest player in the alcohol business. This would be like akin to creating a regulator for the gasoline trade and then exempting Shell, Petro-Canada, and Imperial Oil from the rules. Doesn't make sense. It gets worse, folks. The ministerial master of the LCBO was the Ontario Minister of Finance. We recently informed the finance ministry about the issue of gifts and scholarships and whatnot, and we asked what the ministry planned to do about it. The answer? It was determined that this was, quote, an internal LCBO operational issue. Translation, the finance ministry is confident the LCBO is able to police itself in such matters. Yeah, and I'm sure we can entrust the fox to guard the hen house too. Bottom line, it's high time to privatize the so-called liquor corruption bureaucracy of Ontario, as many of its suppliers refer to the LCBO. This abusive booze monopoly likes to preach social responsibility. Its actions, alas, reveal a completely different story. And that's the Menzoid Monologue.